Okay. People read this? Okay. A new dark age is now near. Today's brutish imperialism. This is the document that Lynn basically told the whole organization, leave me alone for four or five days so I can finish this. Um, I just want to read one quote from like two-thirds into it. <coughs> sort of set the context for what I want to talk about today. We live with a certain practical access, if we are able, to a special kind of immortality as efficiently memorable personalities of an historically, upwardly self-evolving species, evolving not biologically, but as mentally transgenerational, explicitly created beings, as it is written in the image of the Creator. That fact about us is virtually everything most essential that we need to know, essentially, in treating the principal subject of this report. Now, you got some sense of what's been happening in the realm of phenomena, you know, what events have occurred, the crazy meeting today, the stupid bailouts, you know, the proposals, etc. I thought it very, I think the essence of it was captured in a very small slug I saw in our briefing, which says that after all the hoopla about Bush's program to help out people having trouble paying their mortgages, they, they said they were gonna they were gonna help 400,000 people stay in their homes, and this is a national nationwide program that has managed to help 42 homeowners. <laughs> 42. All right, now 400,000, that's kind of aiming low. But if you get 42 out of 400,000, what is that? You know? He would do better if he just, you know, resigned. That would, that would, that would help right there. I mean, you know. It's nutty. But it just shows you the problem. Now, why could they only help 42 people? Is it because people didn't know their phone number? Because <laughs> they didn't have enough money? No, because the rules of this program specified that the mortgages that they were going to help people pay had to be unsecuritized. This is a fancy word for saying that the guy that you, that the bank that uh, sold you the mortgage has got to still be owning it and it wasn't bundled up with 100,000 other mortgages and sold to a financial institution, you know, is it part of a uh, derivatives contract? And so far, they found 42 of those. <laughs> anyway, so this is why Lynn was so emphatic. You know, leave me alone for. I don't know, five days or whatever it was. So you write this. Because he knew it was coming, right? This is, you know, a couple of weeks before the the great election. <coughs> Obama would be coronated. You know, the first black president elect, yay. In the middle of this gigantic crisis, nobody had any clue how to deal with except for LaRouche. I mean, he's been warning people about this for, how the hell is it, like 30-some years now, more than that, that this was inevitable because of the fundamental assumptions built into the financial system and, and how it affected that which is the real issue or the real subject of economics, which is what he referred to here, is our existence as immortal efficiently immortal beings uh, in the image of the creator. Now, some background on LaRouche. In a nutshell, he proved that that's the basis of economics. <laughs> he proved that rigorously, if you will, scientifically, that this isn't an issue of religion or doctrine. This is an issue of science. That economy is about 
the nature of mankind as a self-evolving species, evolving not biologically, but mentally transgenerational, explicitly creative, in the image of the creator. Okay. Now, why would anybody disagree with that idea? Maybe there's some people here who disagree with that idea. I don't know. You can say so if you like. Open discussion. You know, don't 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 be afraid to state your objections or ask questions or whatever. I mean, that sounds nice, but Larouche was able to demonstrate in the fifties and in the sixties that. The, the key to human survival is economic progress in the sense of, of a, a person making an original discovery of a new scientific principle and applying that scientific principle to mankind's practice, like to industry, to medicine, you know, to, to, to statecraft, or in the case of uh, more generally in a culture, in, in terms of uh, classical art, increasing mankind's power over nature. Improving the conditions un, uh, whereby mankind relate to one another. These things increase what he called the uh, uh, society's potential relative population density. In other words, the measurement of the success of an economy is the ability to create more people and support more people at a higher level of existence than before self-evolving species. Now, uh, you might guess that the, he, when he says evolving, he doesn't mean you know we're growing extra arms or we're getting <laughs> bigger and stronger. Um, well, some, some of us. Were. <laughs> that's part of it. You don't want people to, to be growing sickly and weak. But it's not, a, it's not a biological issue. It's an issue of... Not even an issue of being smarter. It's an issue of better conceptions, developing cultures that are based on less imperfect ideas of how the universe is organized and the nature of, of mankind. That's, that's progress. That's what has enabled the human species to go from you know, maximum maybe 10 or 15 million people that could be supported if we lived like baboons to 6 billion plus population that we have now. So, getting back to the issue of this paper, okay. We obviously, the financial system, you know, the, the uh, arrangements where people borrow money and lend money in order to pay for what we call economic activity. Although, what that passive economic activity these days is goes from ridiculous to disgusting. Um, you know, I mean, if you pay a man, if you pay somebody a hundred thousand dollars to kill somebody, is that a, is that uh, the state, uh, creation of economic value? <laughs> yeah, you got to pay the tax on it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But, I mean, finances is not the issue. Money is not the issue. The issue is what he identified here. Why is that? Well, I mean, in a negative sense, you can show that any society that stagnates technologically is going to use up the spectrum of resources that's defined by their technology. If they don't progress, they're eventually going to run out of something. Or long before they run out, it's going to be too economically costly. You hear all these people whining about there's not enough oil, we're going to run out in 10, 20, 30 years, it's going to be a disaster. Is that, I mean, do, do human beings worry about those things? Should humans be actually worried about running out of oil? You know, can you say nuclear energy? Bush can't. <laughs> Nuclear. <laughs> right? The stuff is old. Right? We, we know how to blow things up with it. We know how to 
run submarines on it, and we've been generating electricity with it for decades. So let's build some of these plants finally, and stop worrying about the the oil. Um, our movement, we've we've covered this issue. We we used to have a magazine called Fusion. <laughs> All right, you know what Fusion is? It's how H bomb works, which is a lot more powerful than an atom bomb. It's like what goes on in the sun. This is the kind of technology we should be using to generate energy and transmuting matter, you know, creating states of matter that don't exist, you know, creating hydrogen metal, which is light and almost indestructible, things like that, you know, creating new isotopes that haven't existed for the benefit of humankind. We could do all of that. So to be worried about oil, and maybe if you're a dinosaur, you should be worried about oil. <laughs> but not a human being. <laughs> All right, anyway, Delirious proved if you don't advance your technology, you're going to run out of what supports human life, and you're going to have a collapse of the standard of living, and it's not going to stop until you reverse the technological stagnation or backwardness. All right? Now, in the culture that we live in today, this is institutionalized, right? Over the past... Well, I'll, I'll say roughly 40 years. I mean, I'm, I'm 46. I remember when this stuff really got into the culture big time, when they had Earth Day in 1970. <coughs> I was in, like, the second or third grade. This was the most boring crap I ever heard of. You know, <laughs> take a whole period of school and go around cleaning up the, 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 <laughs> the trash for Earth Day. I'm supposed to be learning science and math and... And then they had some rock concert or something. <laughs> 1970. Now it's like embedded in the culture. You know, this idiot Gore, you know, came pretty close to being president. You know, and it, it's explicitly his policy that it's better to, you know, keep things cool for some polar bears, supposedly, uh, even if you have to exterminate half the world's population. He's against population growth. He's against people. He prefers polar bears. <laughs> All right, now maybe that may sound harsh, but I mean, you, you look at his family history. It's there's a there's a whole attitude there, which we're going to talk about, which is, the, is one of the things that it, Lin, Lyndon addressed in this paper. This is the issue of the mindset of the imperialist or the oligarch, the person that thinks he's better than you. That his family is better than you. The person that rejects the idea of human beings being immortal beings in the image of the Creator, instead that says that they're just animals. Uh, now, before I go further, I just want to mention one thing that I thought of today that I think is relevant. You, anybody hear about the latest Nobel Prize winner in economics? Joseph. Uh no, he, he no. won it before. Oh. Paul Krugman, mm -hmm. he's an economics professor at Princeton University. <laughs> okay. Uh, he won it like last month sometime. What? Economics. What did he do? <laughs> I didn't even. I don't even care. It's now I was. So anyway, he. Uh, I'll come back to why I really thought of this. You can look on the internet different things about his press conference and things that he said on different talk shows. But one of the jobs he had before he got the Nobel Prize, this is like, you know, eight years ago or something, was he was hired as a consultant to Enron. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's not fair to attack him because he didn't work for them very long. You can guess why. <laughs> but then he said but he said you know when I figured out what Enron was doing I got concerned because I realized that they were doing this this must be going on all over the place you know the, 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 the gaming of the energy product that they were doing you know driving up energy prices artificially um, you know they, they, I mean, they did not make profits by providing energy to support human life, to support industry. That's not what they were doing. And he says, and I realized this must be going on all over the entire economy. But nobody thought it was this bad. Nobody could have predicted this. Okay? No, eh, wrong. 
LaRouche warned. He told you. He said so. So, you know, your Nobel Prize, you know, that just proves you're incompetent. As LaRouche said, if anybody ever tried to give him a Nobel Prize, he would sue them for slander. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the definition of incompetence. Remember the guy that got it uh, in 94? He got it for proving that slavery was the most uh, efficient way to produce food. Yeah. His name is Vogel. All right. Now, this is the best part. The best part was... I saw him on Nightline the day he got the Nobel Prize, or the day it was announced. And they asked him how he got started in economics. Listen to this. When he was a teenager, he read the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov. Do you know what that is? No. Three stories written in the 50s. It's about a galactic civilization, you know. Billions of people, trillions of people on thousands of planets throughout the galaxy. And they're going into a dark age. And there's this brilliant genius named Harry Seldon. He's a scientist. He's developing, he developed a whole new science called psychohistory. (laughs) It's based on the idea that, no, it's, it's based on the, see, psychohistory wasn't possible before you had a galactic civilization, right? Because you've never had a civilization that was composed of trillions of people. And the basic idea is, you can't tell what an individual person is going to do. But when you have trillions of people, you can apply statistical gas theory and quantum mechanics (laughs) to human behavior. And you can predict with the certainty of, of... thermodynamics, what human beings are going to do. And that, he was able to forecast the collapse of the civilization before anyone else. And then he creates this priesthood of mathematicians. Because it's all mathematics, right? Priesthood of mathematicians that are ma- mastering psychohistory so that they can direct the, re- the, the recreation of uh, civilization from the ashes of the one that's collapsing. And that's enough. <laughs> so this guy, Paul Krugman, he read this as a teenager and he was excited and he said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> but since psychohistory hadn't been invented, he decided to become an economist. <laughs> that's right. Psychohysterical. <laughs> All right, so he has his Nobel Prize now, so he's a certified idiot. <laughs> Just one other thing. I, I gotta mention this too. All right. You've heard of intelligent design, right? These guys that are saying that you know, well, they, they like to argue with people like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins says anybody that believes in God is, is an idiot. That science can explain everything, you know, or put it this way: empiricist science can explain everything, <laughs> right? And the idea of God is just, you know, produced by people who aren't very intelligent, who don't want to face reality. And the intelligent design people, they say that if you look around at the, the wonder and majesty and beauty of the universe, it proves that it had to be designed by somebody intelligent. All right, now I think that's kind of obvious, but there's a political movement involved with this, which is, I mean, I think the two main people that I've heard about... One of them is a guy named Ben Stein. You ever heard of him? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same guy. Yeah. Really? He, but yeah, he, he, he financed this movie about how these atheistic, godless bastards are trying to stop intelligent design from being discussed in schools. Oh. Yeah, he's the guy with the Clear Eyes commercial. <laughs> clear Eyes. You know, that guy. <laughs> he was a speechwriter for, for, for Richard Nixon. He's a free trade <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> He's one of the main guys behind intelligent design. There's this other guy, Frank <laughs> Tipler. He's a physics professor. And he actually, I, I recognize his name because he wrote the textbook I had in freshman physics in, in his college. <coughs> this guy has rigorously proven the existence of God. Why? 
because he says that at the rate of progress of of uh, computer capacity, memory storage capacity, and the speed of computing, within 50, maybe 100 years, we'll be able to build a computer that could replicate every possible state of existence of the universe. <laughs> Therefore, could it be able to replicate, you know, you have enough storage capacity to, to, to replicate the, uh, the uh, physical state of every human being that's ever lived, <laughs> and every human being that ever will live. And, uh, and essentially, you know, within a few hundred years, you'll be able to develop a computer that's omniscient and omnipotent. <laughs> and that's God. <laughs> and that includes, you know, the ability to tr travel back and forth in time and all other stuff like that. Okay, so... All right, and these are the ones that are supposedly against atheism. You guys see a problem with this? <laughs> no wonder the financial system is collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> this is our standard of, you know, intellectual brilliance. I mean, of course, you know, Bush is president. That proves a lot, too. <laughs> right. So anyway, you, you got to realize, what... what why would somebody reject the principle that LaRouche is, is uh, describing as the basis of this paper? I mean, in other contexts, LaRouche has identified this question of the unique capacity of the human being to create ideas, to, to make scientific discoveries as being the, uh, the basis of all morality, or the, the idea of, of the human being's relative immortality as the basis of morality. Now, who here thinks that they're not immortal? You're all immortal? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Usually there's somebody that doesn't think they're immortal. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Does that mean you're not going to die? No. All right, well, let's get that out of the way. You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> this is an important fact of this presentation, is that you are going to die. Physically, your body is going into the ground, or it's going to be burned up. It's not going to last. I mean, if we're lucky, you know, maybe there will be breakthroughs in science. Maybe you could live a couple hundred years or something. But eventually, that's it. So, how could LaRouche, who's pretty smart, because he forecasts the collapse we're going through and has the solutions for it, how could he say that we're immortal? Now, if you, if you were laying in bed all day and you didn't do anything, didn't read anything, didn't change anything in the universe, you might as well be dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? pretty much in the state that you will be when your biological body shuts down, right? <laughs> but in actual fact, I mean, so how do you judge a person's existence? It's by what they cause to occur. What they change for good or ill, right? That's what... <coughs> that's the model for existence, isn't it? Or is it not? You can tell me. Now... I'm going to talk about some ideas that are thousands of years old tonight. So, not in the spiritual sense of like a mentalist, I will be channeling, channeling Plato. <laughs> in the sense that the ideas that he developed and wrote down and fought for 2,500 years ago, hopefully will be recreated in your mind to some degree. And I mean, the, the, the best I could hope for is that you would be inspired to master some of these great ideas that we're going to deal with so that you can be like, like Plato. I mean, he's been dead for 2,500 years. But hopefully he's going to create a new image in your mind tonight 
2,500 years later, even though he's dead. So is he really dead? Even if just one of you figures out something you didn't know before, and you are able to apply it to the way you think and the way you act, then that's going to be, you know, that's Plato's immortality. And hopefully this is, that's going on in a lot of different places and will accelerate over the course of the next months and years. Because this is necessary. So, yeah, you're going to die, but you are immortal. The good that you contribute to society, the ideas that you generate or assimilate and pass on, and the, the, the actions that you do toward creating the good for civilization, or the ones that you omit to do, that is going to live on after you're in the ground. In a certain sense, that's the test of your, you know, whether your existence was a net benefit or a minus for, for mankind as a whole. So, it, it, I mean, it's pretty obvious you're going to affect the future, right? Anybody deny that? Okay. You're going to affect the future either for good or for ill. And frankly, if you don't do anything, you just decide, well, I'm going to just not affect anything. You might as well, you know, be, you know, killing people for the sake of the polar bears with Al Gore. If you sit there and let his kind of thinking dominate. It's pretty, so, I mean, it, you don't have, most people don't have a problem thinking, oh, well, I do something now, it's going to have effects in the future. But it also affects the past. Right? For example, one of the reasons he wrote this paper the way he did was he had to dispel this crazy idea in the minds of some people that he's trying to address. But let me back up a bit. Lin Lyndon says, in essence, the way we're going to end this crash, end this destruction, this, this descent into a new dark age, is we've got to reverse instantly policies of the last 30 years. We have to throw, take all this financial derivatives, gambling debt, and just throw it in the wastebasket. Start over. Keep people in their homes. Keep productive industry going. But then we've got to revive technological progress. We've got to build infrastructure. And not just in, you know, in the United States. We've got to do it globally. And as, as was identified in th th this briefing we had and others this is going to be led by four nation states if it's going to happen at all. And it's a big if. But we have to do it. There's no alternative. The United States, Russia, China, India, they have to lead the way. And I, you know, LaRouche gave a, you know, he gave a presentation, had a dialogue with some leading individuals earlier this week. And this question came up. Somebody said, I can understand the United States, Russia, and China, but why India? And, I, and the report was kind of refreshing to hear where Lynn basically said, you idiot, there's a billion people there. <laughs> you know, that's the human race. How are you going to create a recovery if you exclude the human race? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's nice to hear. The other thing that was nice to hear was... You know, Lynn addressing the issue of Africa. And we should build, build infrastructure, power, and transportation, water, health, all of it for Africa as a gift, not as a loan, but a gift. Why? Well, yeah, it'll it'll turn Africa into a breadbasket that it could feed the world. But we ought to do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, do any politicians ever say that, or economists? Do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because of the profit margin. That's what that's what we have to get back into our thinking. Policy making on a global scale. It's gotta be done fast. All right? So so what do you have what what kind of problems do we have? We got problems with Russians who ought to know better. Thinking of the United States as an imperial power, which is insane. 
they got to go back and study history. I mean, LaRouche has been telling them, they know what, the top intellectuals. When Lynn got out of prison, that he was put in prison by the enemies of humanity. When he got out in 94, you know, half the stage was covered with Russians. <laughs> Russian scientists who were astounded at this guy. So they know better. Right? So why should they fall for some stupid British trick? You know, creating a, a, a conflict. I mean, you don't need an excuse to create a conflict with Bush. So that's not the issue. The guy's on his way out. Right? So rather than focus on ending the civilization threatening collapse, dealing with that, you know, they're getting sucked into this little confrontation. Right? Now, I, mean, I can't address all the issues because I don't know a lot of the predicates of like this. For example, he addresses the issue of Rosa Luxemburg, who, you know, in her time, she identified this problem of British imperialism, very clear and explicit about it, and everybody else was not. When they, they, he made clear that uh, LaRouche addresses this idea, you know, what's wrong with Karl Marx? Because, you know, Russia's not communist anymore, but, I mean, let's face it, all these people came up under communism, the ones that are running the country now. That ideology is still in their minds. Even if they go to the Russian Orthodox Church. Maybe especially if they go to the Russian Orthodox Church. They got the same, they got this, you know, this ideological problem. Is, you know, are they, on the one hand, the, the, the Soviet society, you know, they were, they had some of the greatest scientific minds that existed this century. On the other hand, they couldn't get it together, you know. If they had a quota to produce a billion nails, they would produce a billion pounds of nails, you know, they produce a billion one billion pound nail and then go home and get drunk. <laughs> That's the kind of economy you had there. <laughs> That's one of those jokes about the Soviet system. <laughs> if you if, if you don't recognize the the uniqueness, the 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 uh well, the sacredness of the individual human mind, you don't honor that. I mean, obviously, they have some inkling of that in the area of science applied to military production. But when it comes to getting that into the civilian economy, it didn't happen. All right, just got to address that issue. And you have to address the real, you know, the, uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the room that nobody wants to talk about, which is the British Empire. The Brutish Empire. They want to say, oh, it's the United States causing all the problems. No. You look at the history of the, of the world since up, leading up to the founding of the United States. You want to talk about a intellectual breakthrough, a uh, you know, an invention that increased mankind's mastery over nature that uh, improved the potential population density. The founding of the United States on the basis of the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, that that's a tremendous upward increase in mankind's potential. The ideas embodied in it. That doesn't have anything to do with George Bush being in the White House. That's, you know, it's one of those little conflicts you know, between uh, potentiality and actuality, right? That such an idiot would be in such a position of power as the presidency of the United States. But what the re what the U.S. Constitution represents in its potential to transform uh, human society, you know, it says that we we these uh, what does it say? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right. Now, it doesn't say, if you live in North America. That's a statement of principle for the entire world. All right? That's a breakthrough. All right? Now... What would I start with? I said I was talking about changing the past. Right? If we don't change the course that we're on now, 
the 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 good embodied in all of that the ideas in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States that will die that could die it could be wiped off the face of the earth and if that happens that nullifies the good that has been created by the you know the, the small handful of people that created the ideas of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people you know who came over from Europe and Asia and South America and Africa to build a, a nation that's based on those principles a lot of people gave their lives and their their ex the entire existence and being to fight for those ideas to live you know to die for those ideas and they're they're going to vanish from the planet if we don't do what we have to so that's that's kind of a intense responsibility to think about so Lynn was I mean Lynn is not Lynn is just not stupid, right? He, he says, if you don't get these axioms, these errors of thinking, this, or, or just brutal ignorance out of your mind, and you know, look at things from the standpoint of reality, what's the point of laying out a programmatic plan for an economic recovery? Because you'll be incompetent to implement it. So that's why he wrote this paper. And we've had several presentations on this theme, on this idea. I think Matt did a presentation. I didn't I haven't seen it on the web, so and I wasn't there. About the crucial relationship between the United States and Russia. And uh, Merv gave a presentation on this theme where he attacked the, the idea that there's some small group of people who are imperialists that are making this happen. Yes, there are imperialists, there are genocidalists, there are financiers that have wrecked the economy. But that's not the problem. The problem is people who carry the same axiomatic assumptions about the nature of mankind or the nature of knowledge, you know, in their minds and in their hearts. And despite all their good intention, if they have any, you know, not only are they going to not stop this, you know, the small handful of powerful oligarchs that are at the center of what sh should be rightly identified as imperialism, they're going to hasten the destruction of the human race. There's no point in, 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 in you have to change the thinking. You have to, you know, you know how they talk about the inner child? <laughs> you have to get in touch with your inner imperialist and, you know, <laughs> evict him. <laughs> <laughs> or educate him or whatever I don't know. beat his head in I don't know. elevate him let's be, let's be generous okay. yeah. end imperialism in yourself now we have to I, I want to address what he was talking about here about this immortality question how can we be immortal because like I said we're going to die we know we're going to die Okay. Well, let's look at some of the ideas that, <clears throat> well, I said before, the population, if, if we live like baboons with no science and no technology, you know, we live like Adam Smith wants us to live, you know, avoid pleasure, I mean, uh, seek pleasure and avoid pain, <laughs> succumb to the passion that unites the sexes, you know, what's the other one? Follow our immediate instincts without regard to the beneficent effects, mm -hmm. you know, that the creator intended to create by them. You know, living like Adam Smith, there'd only be 15 million people on the planet. But there's a reason that there's six billion people, or there's a reason that there's at least six billion people. There's a reason we're able to go to the moon. There's a reason we should go back to the moon. <coughs> right? And I mean, that's the issue, right? What kind of ideas make all that possible? What kind of ideas make that, well, 
I'm not going to say make it necessary. It is, it is necessary. The universe is constructed that way. And the people who think in that that way, like LaRouche, they're, they're the ones responsible for the fact that we got 6 billion people and we could have 26 billion people or 600 billion people. Guy, we could even have the trillion people taking over the galaxy, except we're not going to be acting like gas. <laughs> <laughs> not if we think like Paul Krugman, though. It's not going to happen. <laughs> we can even bring polar bears with us. <laughs> but not Al Gore. <laughs> That's possible because mankind, we're creatures of ideas. We don't live by our physical body and live by our ideas. We can figure out things. We can figure out how to change our behavior to increase our power over nature. You know. And what are, where where do these ideas come from? Who invented ideas? <laughs> hmm? What'd you say? Anybody say something? Well, I don't know. I mean, Socrates and Plato, they have a pretty good clean. <laughs> so I want to talk about Plato from the standpoint of what we're talking about here and um, and that may just be it for tonight but <laughs> we gotta, well at least we'll bring it back to what LaRouche has been working on for 50 years or so and um I also want to give you some idea of where all this brutish imperialist evil came from. Because it's not about people being English. You know, it's not about the Isles, it's like, you know, just some genetic center of evil. <laughs> In the paper, Lynn identifies this all, he, he basically says, this is all coming from Paolo Sarpi, who nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> Who the hell is Paolo Sarkis? <laughs> Was he like the big mafioso? No, he's been dead for 400 years. More or less. About 400 years. <coughs> I wrote it. Remember I, remember I did the class on Venice in July? For some reason I couldn't sleep last night, so I listened to it again. <laughs> I was bad on the dates. I was really bad. Okay. Paolo Sarpi, 1551-1623. Okay, write that down. So, yeah, that's about 400 years. But he's still doing evil. He's still messing up minds. He may be even messing up your mind right now. <laughs> I want you to see, the, I want you to get the positive before we get to the negative. Right. But well, I, he, this guy was, he created the 30 Years' War. Right. He, he, was, uh, he promoted, he is why people in, who study science think Galileo is the founder of modern science instead of Kepler. Because of Sarpy. That may not sound like a big deal to you, but it's, it's you should watch that Harvard Yard video because you see how that messes up everything. All right, if human if, if if human existence and progress is based on scientific pro uh, discovery and progress, then you can't have people thinking that Galileo was the founder of modern science. You can't have people thinking that Newton discovered gravity. Because if you do, then you don't then you don't have any efficient connection to the actual ideas that made modern science possible. And you know, I'm not going to say that much about Kepler, because people here do Kepler to death around here, and you just need to be engaged in it. But as Lynn says, Kepler is crucial to all this because of well, I mean, Lynn's been saying that Kepler was the founder of modern physical science since at least 1971 that I've read. He's never gone off of that one bit. You know, he thought a lot more about Euler and Newton back then than he does now. 
because of what he's discovered, but he's just his his valuation of Kepler is only increased. And he is he's identified that for the younger generation that has got to clean up the mess that we're suffering through now, that he's the key to mastering the ideas that are going to um, revive science. So just make sure you're here tomorrow for the Kepler branch, and the, the, the Kepler session. All right, so so we're going to, all right, so oh, Kepler, 1571, what, 1623, all right? 1630, 30, 30, 30, yeah, 1630, okay, sorry. <laughs> so we're going to jump way back to ancient Greece. All right, and Linden has identified some ideas that are really critical to civilization, and he has often emphasized the uh, the work of Plato. I mean, this is where this is where science began, and it's in ancient Greece. I mean, not with Plato, but it became very explicit. He wrote a a a, a, a book while he was in prison. Called Project A, which is part of like there's three books that are in this book that Lerouge wrote while he was in prison. Project A is on the subject. I mean, it's basically about Parmenides' dialogue and the monadology, which Miwa had, was dealing with on Wednesday. That the, these are the, the if you want to understand human uh, science. You want to understand how the universe works, and how we have to, and how we're going to save civilization. And you have to master what's in the monadology and the Parmenides. Now, in his case, it's kind of funny. I thought of this when me while I was talking on Wednesday. Is that Schiller, the poet of freedom? You know, one of the key points of his development was his refutation of Immanuel Kant. Right. Same thing for Larouche. <laughs> And LaRouche was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> and his autobiography emphasized that at, at a young age, he, you know, he got a collection, you know, Harvard, what's it called, the Harvard Classics. Mm -hmm. We have some of them back there, most of them. Don't waste too much time. I'll tell you which ones to read. <laughs> and he like goes through all these British philosophers. <laughs> Who are all infected with the Venetian disease? Um, Hobbes, Locke, Hume, then Descartes in there, and Rousseau and Voltaire. All this, you know, like, my God! And then he comes to Leibniz. And he says, "Ah, finally, a human being." <laughs> <laughs> and he studied the monadology, mastered it. He studied the the, the Odyssey about the nature of God, defense of God. <laughs> um, and he mastered it. And he said, like, that was like the defining point of his uh, intellectual development. E everything else he's done from, from that, since then, was from that reference point. And then he spent two years refuting Kant. He was definitely a step backward for civilization. But we're going to go to Plato. Now, in, in this project, yeah, he emphasizes Plato's dialogues, and in particular, the uh, Parmenides dialogue, which is on the question of the one and the many. Or let's make it simple. Remember I said, who invented ideas? <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if you can think of a simpler idea than one. simple, huh? <laughs> <coughs> well? About nothing. Huh? About nothing. nothing is simpler than one? <laughs> All right, I guess you got me there. <laughs> we can discuss nothingness later. <laughs> we have to get some berets and some uh, espresso and go... <laughs> No, 
he says about the Parmenides is that, you know, this, I mean, this is crucial to any idea of science. And there's, a, there's, there's some breakthrough work being done by our basement crew. Some of who are lurking in here. <laughs> Others are in the basement <laughs> working hard to revolutionize science. And a lot of what's in Parmenides is very relevant to what they're talking about, what they're working on. In fact, uh, I got a little description of something that they're going to come out with in a video about Bernard Riemann, you know, the, the great physicist and philosopher on whom LaRouche's economic method you know, derives, you know, is a direct, you know, his Berlin make create uh, Realize he made an intellectual breakthrough in mastering what Riemann was saying about the nature of the universe and the nature of uh, mathematics with regard to the universe, which was, you know, it led to his ability to identify this principle that's at that the heart of economics and to represent it as a, as a, uh, well, re represent it mathematically, non-mathematically, put it that way, or the paradox, the paradox of economics, which is at the heart of all human progress. Anyway, so that video is coming out, something to look out for, but it has direct relevance to what we're talking about here, about one. Now, can you think of something, if you can't think of it as a one? you think about that before we get started? Well, because then it's some things. Then it's things? <coughs> what if you think of something that you don't know? What if you think of something that you don't know? Is that something? Well, when will you know what it is? <laughs> you might have to go through the process. <coughs> We have to develop some kind of idea, right? But is, is there going to be, uh, is the idea going to be one? Is it one idea? Well, I mean, these, I'm throwing these questions out. I don't want you to think about it. Don't listen to me. I don't know anything. <laughs> Hopefully, some of Plato will get through to you from me. Or at least you'll say, God, what the hell is he talking about? I better go read it. <laughs> get him. Actually, it should draw a picture. When I, Jerry Rose gave a presentation about, uh, should I leave this here? No. No? Didn't pay for the wine? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty evil. picture because the roof's told me to. No, no. Try it. Looks like white. You can't see it? Oh, no. <laughs> no, never you see it. Why is it here? Saturday night, Jerry Rose gave a presentation on this. I got really excited about it. I said, I'm going to read Parmenides. I'm going to understand what this is about. Let's see. Is the hexagon good enough? Yeah. I can't even draw one. <laughs> you can't see it. Can you see it? A little better. <laughs> All right, what I'm trying oh. <coughs> I'm trying to draw a circle <coughs> which is blue, which is circumscribed and inscribed by a hexagon. Well, two hexagons, one's on the outside and one's on the inside. 
Can you kind of see that? There's a circle in here. Circumscribed by a hexagon and has a hexagon inscribed in it. Okay, more or less. And this is like the basic construction on the basis of which Archimedes tried to figure out how to square the, the circle. In other words, how to create a, uh, a rectilinear figure that would have the same area as a circle. As, as you, well, if you start with a hexagon and then double the number of sides, have a 12-sided figure on the inside and on the outside, the one on the outside is getting smaller and smaller, but it's always con completely containing the circle. And the one on the inside is getting bigger and bigger, but it's always inside. And you can you can figure out the, the rectilinear area of the hexagon and the recti on the inside and the one on the outside, and the area of the green circle would be in between. And there's two kinds of people in the world, maybe three, that kind of don't think about these things <laughs> at all. The kind that think that you can if you continue this process to infinity. That you're going to get an equality of the rec of the uh, hexagons with the circle, and those that realize that the circle is of a different nature entirely, so that no matter how many sides you have of hexagons, twelve agons, twenty-four agons, forty-eight agons, etc., you're never going to have a circle that way. In other words, you can't create the species of action represented by the circle by uh, rectilinear action, straight lines. Now, I described that because because I asked LaRouche about how to teach the ideas in the Parmenides, and he kept referring to this. He actually sent me a message from prison about this. <laughs> this is how you, you have to under, you have to think about the sequence of the polygons trying to approximate the circle. Never getting there. Never going to get there. <laughs> Completely different con conception. You know, this, I mean, you could go through infinite differences between the polygons and the circle. In fact, the more sides you add, the less circular the polygons will get. Because why? Because huh. circles don't have corners. So you're going <laughs> to add corners? going to get you a circle? No. So he said, that's the geometric construction that corresponds to Plato's Parmenides. Or the failure of that construction corresponds to the failure of Parmenides. Okay, he didn't write this because he thought Parmenides was a great thinker. Okay. There's a poem that, that all right, let's situate it. Let's see. Parmenides was a, let's see. He's older than Socrates. In, in the dialogue, Parmenides is like 60. His uh, boyfriend, Zeno, is 40. <laughs> in his prime manhood. <laughs> you heard of Zeno. He's the guy that proves that the, the, the tortoise will catch the hare or, or something, or that the hare will never catch the tortoise, that the arrow will never leave the bow. You heard of those paradoxes? <laughs> basically proving that there's no change. <coughs> right, Parmenides wrote, wrote this poem where he says that that not that which uh, you know that which is is unchanging and everlasting and nothing that is not will ever be. <laughs> Something like that. It's pretty mystical and weird. Right. <laughs> I mean, you've heard the idea that, that the universe is change, changeless and that all change is an illusion, right? Maybe in your Buddhist monastery. Or <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, when you were taking, you know, taking peyote somewhere at a meeting, <laughs> reservation or something. I don't know. <laughs> this kind of stuff is all over the place. But, huh? Hollywood Yeah. Right. A lot of movies like that. Okay, he was from Elia. He's called Eliadic. Um, and, you know, he's a very famous so-called philosopher. Right. Now, the whole point of this, this dialogue is he's attacking the fallacy of this idea. I mean, you heard of Heraclitus, right? He said, you can't step in the same river twice. The only thing that's unchanging is change. The universe flows like a river. You heard of that? Okay, well, this is, like, this is Plato. He's using... Well, there's a whole drama. I can't get into all the details of it because I want to get to the meat of this thing. It can get you uh, laughing or pissed off depending on your state of mind. <laughs> can you explain that? I don't, I, don't, I don't get that. What do you mean? You can't step in the same river twice? Yeah. Hmm. Don't go try it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's a river? Are you talking about... Physically, what's the difference between a river and a lake? Uh, I think a river is bigger. Oh, also, it's the, the current is more. If the water's wild. not moving, it ain't a river, is it? If the what? The water's not moving. Okay, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, he's saying that you step in the in, in the river once, and you take your foot out, and you put it back. It's a completely different river. Because <laughs> all the parts of the river are gone. The ones that you stepped in. <laughs> Just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. <laughs> Those who think like LaRouche, who are responsible for civilization, they love analogies. <laughs> used in the proper way. Right? Or, shall I say, the process of metaphor. Okay, we'll come back to that. That's what that is. That's a metaphor for reality. Anyway, in uh, in this Parmenides dialogue, uh, starts out with well the ac the actual discussion as opposed to the setting. Of, you know, this one visits this town and he meets this guy he used to know and he used to tell stories about Parmenides and oh, can you tell the story again? Oh, sure. Let me finish making this horseshoe. You know, <laughs> leave that out for now. Not that that's not important. At times. Um, Socrates is, is talking to Parmenides, and he's very impressed with the young Socrates. It's not the old guy in the other dialogues. He's like 20. And they're discussing ideas. And to make a long story short, the discussion is, you know, how, how can I talk about ideas? You know, uh, you know, how can something be, can something be one and many at the same time? Or... If if I have if several people are standing under a sail, are they under the whole sail or only part of the sail? Or, you know, in the day is the day one or is it many? Because it's in many parts, but it's all the same day. You know, things like that. And basically, they're discussing. Well, is what's the difference between an idea and an object of the senses? Is there a difference? And I mean, they're kind of going back and forth on that. You know, at a certain point, he says, "Is there an idea?" Well, I know there's an idea of truth and justice and beauty, but is there an idea of man and beast? Is there an idea of hair? Is there an idea of dirt? <laughs> you know, I don't really want to think about that, but you know. It seems that to be consistent, we have to go there. And Parmenides says, "Oh well, you know, you just haven't thought about it enough. You've got to train yourself. You've got to think about what your objects of thought. You have to to think of them in terms of their context." And um, oh, earlier there's a discussion where Zeno is going through his refutation of he, he proves that if you say that the universe is a many, then it's so many contradictions that. It's absurd, which is like the flip side of what Parmenides was saying, is that all is one. And then, um, 
in order to master the method of, of ideas, you know, Zeno proposes, uh, well, Parmenides, you said you have, you have to work on it. Why don't you give us an example? Why don't we examine your idea of the one? And then Parmenides doesn't want to do it because it's hard work. <laughs> he's an old man, but finally he just agrees that he's going to do it. Okay, I just don't want you to get fooled, right? Uh, I mean, at various points, LaRouche said this thing is a very long joke. <laughs> this whole thing is a whole it's a joke on Parmenides. And the punchline is in the middle. <laughs> but this is the basis of science, so why are you laughing? Science is important. Science is serious. If you're ever going to know anything, you got to know this. Okay. So, all right. So, the, the youngest guy, you know how in the dialogues is always back and forth, right? This time, back and forth is between Parmenides and the youngest guy in the in the uh, entourage there, and Socrates is looking on. So, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do the back and forth, but it's just, we'll just look at the ideas. Or I can pretend to be Parmenides, and you can pretend to be the young guy. If if uh, if there's a one, the one cannot be many. Does that make sense? <coughs> if the one is many, is it one? No. Come on. No. Because it's one. It's not many. <laughs> Isn't one opposite of many? Aren't they opposite ideas? What about like a chair? We're not talking about chairs. We're talking about one. We're going to hear a chair dialogue. That's later. (laughs) (laughs) What? The chair serves one function. (laughs) Okay. Come on. All right. Maybe, maybe, Maybe I should. Maybe I should. (laughs) <laughs> Indicate what's happening here. Okay. <laughs> says the one cannot be many. Because many is opposite of the one. Which means the one cannot be a whole. Because a whole is the sum of the parts. Right? And if it had parts... It would be a many and not a one. So a one cannot be it cannot be many and it cannot be a whole. And the one the one can have no bounds. Because anything that's bounded has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And these would be parts. And if the one had parts, it would be a many. So the one has no limits, no beginning and no end. And then he says the one is neither round nor straight. Because it has no parts. Because that which is round has its extremes equidistant from a from a point, from a center. And extremes and centers are por- parts. And the one has no parts. And if something is straight, that means that it has extremes and the middle is be- exactly between the extremes. Again, those are parts. So the one can neither be round nor sh- straight. So it has no... It is not many. It's not a whole. It's not bounded. It has no shape or form because it has no parts. Well, can the one be anywhere? Can it be in itself? Can it be in another? It cannot be in itself because it would have to encompass itself and touch that which encompasses it at many points. But it has no points because it has no parts. And if it encompassed itself, it would be the encompassing and the encompass. So it would be two. So it cannot be in itself. If the one was in an other, an other than one, that is, it would be surrounded by the other than one and touching it at many points, and it has no parts, no points. It's not around. So it cannot be in itself or in another. So if it's not in itself and it's not anywhere else, then where is it? Are you getting 
Angry yet? Yes. Yes. You are? Why is this bothering you? Yeah. Why? It it seems totally silly. I I tell you, that's most of the reaction I get when I talk about this is either anger or laughter. Yeah, it's silly. If the one (laughs) were in motion, can the one move? Is it in motion or is it at rest? What kind of motion is there? You can change your condition. You can turn around and around in one place, or you can move from one place to another. Okay. Now, if the one moved by changing its condition, that means it would have to become different, right? If something becomes different from w- than one, then it's not one, is it? <laughs> <laughs> now, if the one, if the one could move about in place, it would revolve around the center. So you'd have one part revolving, the other part stationary. But it doesn't have any parts, so it can't revolve. It can't move in place. Now, if it moves from place to place, then that means it's going from the place that it's in to another place. But we showed sure it can't be in anywhere, right? Well, actually, we back up. It would have to come from one place to another. So if it moved, it would be one part would be in one place and one part would be in the other. But it has no parts, so it can't move. That so there's three different ways it can move. So, so can it be at rest? Oh man! It's not in itself, right? And it's not in another than itself. So if it's not in itself and it's not in anything other than itself, then it can't be anywhere. So it's not at rest. It's review. <laughs> the one <laughs> has no part. Cannot be a many. There's not a whole. It has no bounds. It has no shape. It has no form. It cannot be anywhere in itself or another. It cannot move in place. It cannot change condition. It cannot move from place to place. Okay, it's getting kind of interesting. <laughs> what, what is it in this case? One. The one. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the one. <laughs> one. <laughs> all right, so now we look at, can the one be the same as itself or other than itself or different than itself? If the one became other than itself, it would be other than one, right? So it would not one. So it cannot be other than itself. If the one were the same as another, then it would be that other, and it would not be one. Now, for the one to be other than one, well, no. If, if, if the one were to be other than another, does that follow from being one? Being one doesn't make it other than another. So it can't be other than another, because it's not vir- by virtue of being one. That should give you a hint of where this is going. <laughs> so it cannot be other than anything. So the one is cannot be other than one, and it can't be other than another than one. Okay. Now, if something is one, does that mean it's same? The same? Does being one make it the same? Does being the same make something one? No. So then the one can't be the same as another. Or a same as itself. Wait, Come on. <laughs> say that one again. It can, if, if something, is something one when it's the same? Or if something is the same as another or itself, does that make it one? In other words, he's saying that the property of sameness and oneness are different. Because you'd be oneness is not posing it to something else. Yeah, oneness is not sameness. So bottom line, the one cannot be the same as itself or another, and it can't be different from <laughs> itself or another. So why can't it be the same as itself? Because oneness and sameness are not the same, or they're not they're different. Well, because you would be you would so have something for else. For one to be mind. same, it would be different than one. Okay. What? So you would have you would have something else in mind as it being different than, so you would say that it was same as yeah. the one. Something like that. <laughs> All right. Now he goes on to likeness and unlikeness. You can guess 
<laughs> the conclusion. It just says sameness, you know, something is like, that means it has an identical character. Again, he says same, having an identical character is not the same as being one. And obviously, if one has a character different from one, then it would be more than one. So one is not like itself or another. And if it was different from another, then it would be one and different, but it wouldn't be one. And the same if it was different from another. Okay. Now, if the one is equal, never get dealing with equality and inequality. If the one were to be equal to something, it would have the same number of measures as that something. The one has no sameness, so it can't have the same number of measures of anything. So it cannot be equal to itself or another. I don't hear that much laughing going on. So, so can the one be greater than another? More, more measures than another or less? Well, if it had measures, then it would have parts. So it can't be greater or less than itself or another. And so on. So then we come to time. If the one were the same age as itself or another, it would be equal in duration and likeness. <laughs> and the one has no equality in likeness. But the one has no inequality in unlikeness. So it cannot be younger than itself or older than itself or another. If something occupies time, it must always be becoming older than and younger than itself. And it must be becoming older and younger than itself for the same time as itself. So it must be the same age as itself. Do I need to explain that? We'll come back to that. So the one cannot be the same age as itself and cannot be becoming older and younger than itself. And it cannot be becoming the same age as itself. So the one has nothing to do with time and does not exist in time. Ergo, the one does not exist. Can that possibly be true of the one? Uh, you is that you asking or for me? <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does matter. <coughs> I want to know the answer. Huh? Parmenides isn't here. I'm here. So, what do you think? <coughs> can this be true of the one? Well, eternity would have to exist. We're talking about the one. I know, but if you're saying like one doesn't exist in time, then it would have to exist in something that's encompassing. Well, it's it's not anywhere though, and it's not moving, and it has no shape, it has no like form, and it doesn't exist in time because it can't be older or younger than itself, or becoming older or younger than itself, and it can't be the same age as itself. It sounds like the point. Yeah. Hmm? It sounds like the point. The point. Yeah. You know, the point which is the beginning of all things, which has no no width or breadth. Or well, if you don't know where the point is, what's, what's the point? Okay, just to move along. <laughs> they all agree this is crazy. All right. This cannot be true of the one. And then Par Parmenides says, "Well, wait a minute. What's the problem here?" All the answers to this question, if there is a one, it's, you know, basically the question really should be rephrased. If the one is one, right? Because obviously, if you want a one that exists, then it can't just simply be one. Because by, by being one, it's none of these other things. And therefore, it's, it has no existence. Does that make any sense? No. He say it again? He's saying that you, if you want a one that exists, then you can't just say that one is one. Now, if you say, so this whole, all these questions were, if the one is one, 
if the one is simply one, then all of these things cannot be true of it. Because that's the only quality that it has, oneness. But by itself, nothing. So he says, if we want to know if there is a one, then we have to separate the idea of oneness and being. We have to identify that the oneness has to have a quality of existing. (laughs) He says, okay, well, let's look at it again. Now we're going to ask if the one exists. Say it that way. It's a little bit different. I mean, basically the same question, but he's identified a different idea than one that has to be true of the one for the one to exist. The one has to have being or existence. Okay, so if the one exists, then that means the one has oneness and being, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's two, isn't it? Yes. We're not one anymore. In fact, doesn't the oneness of the one, I mean, doesn't the the being of the one have to have oneness? To be the being of oneness? Yes? Yes. That's three. Uh, Oneness and being, and the oneness of the oneness is being. (laughs) (laughs) Sound like a preacher. (laughs) <laughs> what did you say? So I went to one of the, the preachers in the, you know, in the churches. You accusing me of confusing you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want you to go read this. Now you can say, oh, well, this is just a bunch of nonsense. But if you look at what he's saying here, he is analyzing the idea of oneness to death. <laughs> You know how they say, break it down? He's breaking it down. He's making you examine this thing that should be obvious, right? What's simpler than one? I mean, we can talk about nothing, but if you talk about nothing, what's there to say? (laughs) Make a (laughs) But if you are serious about ideas, then you have to know about one. So yeah, the one, the oneness of one has to have being. So that's the 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 being of one has to have oneness. So you've got four, and then you can go on and on ad infinitum. So, if the one is to exist, it has to be a whole, and it has to have an infinite multitude of parts. You don't buy that? So, the being of oneness makes the one a many. How could that be true? All right. Well, so look. The, uh, another way to look at it: the oneness now has oneness in being. Is oneness the same as being? No. no. Why okay. not? Because the one without being isn't a one. It's nothing. So now the one has oneness in being, and since oneness and being are different, then now you have difference. So you have three again. Mm-hmm. So you can generate all the numbers from the one. In fact, if you say there is a one, or that there, that yeah, if the one exists, then a number has to exist, and there has to be. Well, the way he describes it, it appears then that unity itself is parceled out by being, and is not only many but indefinitely numerous. So now we're going from oneness to infinity. Look at that. Can you say that again? How we got from oneness to infinity? Well, the the oneness has being. The being of oneness has oneness. The oneness of oneness has being, so that's four. You can go on with all the parts because they all have to have oneness and being. 
And then you're having oneness and being is not this oneness and being are not the same because we wouldn't have this problem. So you have oneness and being, and you have difference, <laughs> or oneness being, oneness being and otherness. Right, you know, it, and it goes on the same way. The difference of the one from the, from the being, and the being of the one, and the difference of being. You can generate all the numbers you want. Now, is the one bounded now? Now, the one has parts. Now, all the parts are parts of a whole, right? Each part is contained in the whole, right? So, if all the parts of something are in something, then that those the parts are contained, the thing is contained. So, the one is in itself. So, all the parts are in the whole. And so the bound of the one is its wholeness. But one was not the whole, right? But it is now, because it has parts, if it exists. Okay. So now it has it has a bound. It has limits, because it has a container. So now it has a beginning and a middle and an end. So now it has shape. Now we talk about location. Well, the parts are each part is in the whole, so the one is contained in the one. But the whole is not in the parts. You can never the, the whole is not. If you look at each part, the whole is not in each part. So the whole must be outside of each part, which means it's outside of the one. So the one has to be somewhere else. It was still from entities. <laughs> yes. One now, since the one is the, the the one that exists is in itself, it's always in the same place, so it's always at rest. But since the one that exists is always in another place, as we said before, because the whole is not in the parts, it's never in the same place. So, if something's never in the same place, it's in motion, right? But if it's always in the same place, then it's at rest. So it's both at rest and in motion. Is this worse than the other one? <laughs> and the same with sameness and difference, we could go back and forth with that. You know, basically, the one is the same as itself, and it's the same as another, and it's different from itself, and it's different from another. Because I mean, something is a di if, if the one is in itself and it's in another, then it's in two different places. So if it's in two different places, it's different from itself. Right? You don't like this? <laughs> okay, and then it says sameness and difference are opposites. Sameness cannot be in what is different, and difference cannot be in what is the same. So, sameness cannot be in anything for any length of time. Well, actually, difference cannot be in the same place or the same thing because it wouldn't be different. So, difference cannot be in the one or in the other, so the one has to be the same as the one and the others. But the other than one is not one. Because if it had, if it was one, it wouldn't be other than one. So the other than one has to be different. Well, it goes on and on. I'm not gonna. I'll stop torturing you at a certain point. <laughs> but you need to read this. <laughs> Me likewise. All right. So he proves that the one is the same as itself and different from itself, and the same as the other than one and different from the other than one. <coughs> then he proves that it's likewise like the one and unlike the one, and it's unlike the other than one, and it's like the other than one. You could even figure this out yourself at this point if you get the idea here. <coughs> Is this reminding you of this? 
Because remember, this is going on forever, infinitely, and it's not getting to be a circle. <laughs> All right. Well, same with contact, same with equality and inequality, less than, greater than, uh, etc. Now, we already, and then we go to time. Let's speed it up here. Since the one exists, then it has being and exists in the present time. And it partook of past time and will partake of future time. So if the one is, then it is in time. But since time moves forward and the one is in time, it's always becoming older than itself. And since it's becoming older than itself, then it's also becoming younger than itself. That make sense? No. <coughs> You're not older than it's yourself? No, I, I didn't, because it's, uh, if it's, if it is itself, then if it is getting older than itself, then it has to be getting older than that, which is get. it has to be getting younger than that, which is getting older. Oh, wait, it's not even really young, it's not it anymore, it's older. But it's itself. It's becoming older than itself. How many birthday cakes are <laughs> well, just like people, they become older than themselves and they become younger than themselves. But they do it at the same time as themselves, so they're the same age as themselves. <laughs> Anything that exists, that's true. <laughs> okay. So let's t let's all right, let's talk about be becoming. If the one is greater than itself and uh, excuse, it's older than itself, younger than itself the same age as itself then it's becoming older than itself and young, younger than itself we also said it has a beginning and a middle and an end because of the thing with the being limited because it's in itself and also in another now it has parts this is interesting Well, you, you can work on this yourself. The one must come to be in a way that's consistent with its nature. We saw that the one has parts. So it has a beginning and a middle and an end. The beginning part becomes comes to be the first. And after the beginning, there's the middle and then there's the end. So does the one exist as a whole before all the parts? Does that make sense? So the one has to so the one has to be younger than itself, or it has to become comes into be after itself, comes to be after itself, and consequently comes to be before itself. But it's all doing this at the same time. When you say it, you said it. Does it exist as a whole before the parts? Yeah. Now, what's the answer to that? And why does that thing? Well, if you so don't have all the parts, then it's not the one, is it? It can't be a whole then. Right. So you have to have all the parts. So the one as a whole doesn't come to be until all the parts come. But how does that, how does that uh, prove what follows? What follows from that? Yeah. That one, that one comes to be... Uh, <coughs> it comes to be after the other than one because the parts are not the one oh, yeah. so it's younger than the other than one and the other than one is older than it hmm. but a beginning of the one or any other part of the one if it is one part must be a one so the one must come to be simultaneously with any and every part of the one. So the one is of the same age as the other than one. All right, there's, there's more. There's stuff about the one becoming older and younger, just like a person, for example. Or like, and then becoming older and younger than the other than one, for the same reason. If someone's older than you, and you both become older, then you're becoming older, and that person's becoming younger. 
right? If you're if you're seven and your brother's fourteen, he's older than you, right? But when your brother is eighty-seven and you're eighty, you've become a lot older. And relative to him, he's become younger. Oh. Isn't that funny? Well, that's the kind of argument he has for that. So basically, the one is both is and is becoming older and younger than itself, and older and younger than that which is other than one, and it is neither becoming older or younger than itself or the other than one. But since it is in time and has the property of becoming older and younger, it has a past and a future and a present. Therefore, the one was and is and will be and was becoming and is becoming and will become. Are you satisfied now? But how can it be all these contradictory things? And actually, he considered, he, he goes on in the same mode and he examines the other than one in the same way. But before he does that, He takes up the discussion. So that's the first two parts of this discussion of the one. Now here's where the fun part comes. Now again, think about the sequence of these uh, hexagons. If the one is such as we have described it, then must it not, being one and many, and neither one nor many, and partaking of time because one is, partake of being at one time and because it is not, again, not partake of being at another time? Does that make sense? If the one is such as we have described it, then must it not, being one and many, and neither one nor many, and partaking of time because the one exists, partake of being at one time and because it is not <coughs> again not partake of being at another time he's saying that one is and is not but can it be and not be at the same time so it has to be it has to be at one time and not at another time well the guy says Aristotle he said yeah that's true and then Parmenides asks, Then when it partakes, shall such a one then not partake? Or when not partaking, partake? And then he says, Not such. This is a translation, by the way, by one of our members. So it's not the thing in the Plato book. Then does it partake at one time and not partake at another? And thus only might it partake and not partake of the same thing? True. And is there not a time when it assumes being and when it gives it up? There is no other way. But do you not call receiving existence becoming? Indeed. And losing existence destruction? Necessarily. The one then, as it seems... Receiving and giving up existence is created and destroyed. Certainly. Then being one and many, and being created and destroyed, then when it becomes one, is not as its existence as many destroyed, and its existence as one destroyed when it becomes many? Certainly. Then becoming one and many, must it not be separated and combined entirely? And when greater and smaller and equal, increased and declined and equalized, <coughs> thus, and when being at rest, it may change to motion, it, may, it, it must itself not be in any one time. And then finally he says, well, how's that? <laughs> 
These things shall not be experienced such that being at rest previously, it is later in motion, and in motion previously, later at rest, without changing. How? There is no time in which anything is neither in motion nor at rest. Then there is not. But indeed, it does it does not change without changing. It seems not. Then when does it change? For neither when it is at rest, nor in motion does it change, nor when it is in time. Then it does not. Do you hear what he's saying here? Mm -hmm. Then does this strange place exist in which then it might be when it changes? What sort? The instant, for the instant, in this manner, seems to point out something. As from one place, it changes to another. For it does not change from rest while still at rest, nor change from motion while still in motion. But the instant itself, some strange being, or nature, sits in between motion and rest, not existing in time. And into this, and out from this, that which is in motion changes to rest, and that at rest to motion. That follows. Then the one, if it is at rest and in motion, might change in each direction, for only thus might it do both. But changing, it changing changes instantaneously. And when it changes, it might be in no time. Neither then might it be in motion nor at rest. No. Then, does it thus hold in relation to other changes, when from being it may change to destruction, or from not being to becoming, that it then becomes between certain conditions of motion and rest, and then neither is nor is not, and neither comes into being nor is destroyed? When is it changing? And according to the same principle, passing from one to many, and from many to one, it is neither one nor many, and neither separates nor combines, and passing from like to unlike, and from unlike to like, it is neither like nor unlike, and neither assimilating nor disseminating, and passing from small to great, and from equal to unequal, it might be neither small nor great nor equal nor increasing, nor decreasing, nor becoming equal. It seems not. Then all these experienced things might happen to the one, if it exists. And then the kid says, how not? All right, since I don't hear uproarious laughter, there must be deep introspection going on. Or fury. I'm going to bet on the introspection. What's the point here? I mean, is he lying? Is this kind of like... What's he saying here? So he's saying that change has to exist for all these paradoxes to be true, but then where can, it, where can that change exist if not in this paradoxical instance? Well, he says there's some there's some insoluble paradox in here. If we say all these things are true of the one, unless there's some nature to the one that we didn't touch, and he's putting his finger on it right there. And I don't want to, you know, give you the answer, but you should think about what this implies and think about this. In other words, he, he's, a, an, he's analyzed being and oneness from the standpoint of all these uh, categories, right? These are just like Aristotle's categories. You know, what the, the, the things that you... <coughs> the states of sense perception that you can perceive in another, in an object. And when you posit the existence of a one... You get all these contradictions. Unless you introduce the element of change. But then how do you locate that where that 
might change your curves if it's not in time. I wonder where. Where is its oneness? In your mind. And where is its manyness? Well, it would be kind of unplatonic or Socratic to tell you the answer, wouldn't it? But I want you to look at that again. The point about this is you keep trying to create a circle with straight lines and angles, you get nowhere. The only way you get a circle is you have to create circular action. Right? Now, what, what, what goes on with it? What, what's going on? Like, what's the difference between a, a polygon and a circle? Curviness? Curviness, yeah. Curviness. Well, a polygon is, goes straight and then abruptly changes once, right? Then it goes straight and abruptly changes again, right? Mm -hmm. So you have continuity and then you have a momentary change and then you, you know. Now, if you, if you do that I mean, that's different from a circle. What's a circle? It has continuous change, right? Mm -hmm. At every instant. You know, every interval of action is, is, is a change. There's no linear continuity there. And it's always changing direction, right? So if you say, okay, well, I had all these six abrupt changes. Why don't I go to 14? I mean, uh, 12. And then 24 and 48. What's the difference? So the polygons have changed and the circle does not. Well, what is the what kind of change the polygon have? Sudden instantaneous violent ones. Sudden violent change. <laughs> 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 and what does the circle have? <laughs> Right, let me look at it another way. Continuous. Revolutionary, yes. <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> Who said that? That's a good one. Got to remember that. <laughs> let me put it this way. Let's flip the question. All right. Is it clear that you can't get a circle from this straight line action? Is the infinite number of abrupt changes going to be equal to a circular action? Let's flip the question over. What does abrupt mean? No, I'm saying abruptness becomes the same as non-abruptness. Okay. Let me flip the question. If you start from circular action, can you generate the polygons? Mm-hmm. You can. Okay. Now, does this help solve the problem of the one and the many? From, from an standpoint? Um, from, from the standpoint of reality, let's think about it that way. Or ideas. Do we, pl do we apply the idea of one and many to what we think of? I, I, well, I don't think that the circle is one or something. And, it's and not a polygons. one? Well, I don't think that the circle is one and the polygons that you can uh, generate from it are the many. I don't, I don't think that that's the case. The polygons aren't the many. Not of the circle. Well, what are they? They might be something you can generate within the circle, but they don't actually have... Because then that would be admitting to the fact that 
that the polygons are a part of the circle, but the circle is something qualitatively different. All right, I just threw out an innocent question. <laughs> no. <laughs> can, you, can you generate a polygon from circular action? Yeah. Can you generate a circle from polygons? No. Okay, now, in this whole discussion here in Parmenides, what happens if you think of the one as a one? the one that exists and you don't and the one doesn't change what happens he said that all these things that we found to be true of the one they mm -hmm. can't be true at the same time is that a paradox or not for it. <laughs> you refuse to laugh. <laughs> Ask me again. He starts from the premise. All right, look, we did the one is one, and that led nowhere. <laughs> right? So he said, okay, well, if the one exists, well, what does that mean? And then you see that if, like he said, if the one that exists, the existence of the one or the being of the one parcels out the one into in infinitely many. Mm -hmm. So then, so then you're saying of this one that it's one and many, and it has to be. But one is the opposite of many. So how's the one going to be the one if it's many? So I have to read Kuza. <laughs> All right, I think that's enough Parmenides, but you go through the same thing in the Philippus and the Sophist. These those dialogues at the end, they're pretty hardcore. <laughs> you know, not a lot of jokes. <laughs> not a lot of jokes. <laughs> well, not a lot of ha ha jokes. But there's a lot of ambiguity. But, uh, now why would LaRouche say that, that's a, that that is a construction that corresponds to this dialogue? <laughs> what is he trying to get at? Can the one be one in many? Well, let's think about other things now. Since since one is so ridiculous, what about other things? <laughs> you know, what about truth? Is truth one? Or remember in the Neo uh, dialogue, Socrates asks him what is virtue, and he tells all the different kinds of virtue for different people. And he says, hey, man, you gave me a swarm <laughs> of bees. I want to know what virtue is, not virtue for the master and the slave and the wife and the child and the doctor don't give me that what's the one but, well the, I want you to think about this the punchline there is when he talks about the, the, the point the, the fact that the one can't be in motion and at rest at the same time or it can't go from rest to motion Right, it's at rest, and then it's in motion. How does it do that? And then you think about that, and then think about 
the things that you see. Can they go from rest to motion? Hmm. Well, they can, can't they? They seem to do that, don't they? But what happens? How does that happen? Is there some paradox involved in that? This is get us back to, to Heraclitus. If the river stops flowing, is it a river? Let's leap ahead a bit. What are the characteristics of life? What are things that are alive do? Live. Thank you. Move. <laughs> they move. Grow. They grow. They respirate. Respirate. Yeah. They reproduce. They reproduce. They die. Mm -hmm. They die. <laughs> okay, now, before they die, what happens? They start, they break down. Now, is there any point where the where this thing that's alive isn't changing? No. Uh, oh. mm. How about the river? Think about the river. If the river's not moving, it's not a river, is it? Now, if something is alive and it stops changing, is it alive? <laughs> is that but possible? It stop changing. Huh? Is it possible for it to stop changing? No. So, what does that tell you about life? There has to be something about it that's not changing. What would that be? I don't know, it's essence or something? It's essence, it's life. Deadness. <laughs> it's deadness. <laughs> it's deadness. Well, if and it's dead, does it stop changing? No. <laughs> well, I should tell dead. you something too. <laughs> so it's always changing, and it gets you into Vernadsky, right? What do living things do to the biosphere? I mean, to the to the earth. Remember that little cartoon of the mouse named Vernatsky I had? <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember his quote? Where he said that oh, life yeah. obtains the matter it needs for its existence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you leave it on the floor. <laughs> and overnight, and crumbs. Life does that, right? <laughs> Process of change, right? Is it a one? Is that mouse a one? <laughs> what did you say? We hope so. What do you think, Michael? What about the soul, Bill? Soul. What about the soul? Is it soul changing? Well, let's think about it. Because we all have a soul, don't we? You in here without a soul? <laughs> Does the soul change? Hmm? What'd you say? Apparently lies, apparently lies and stuff that he disagrees with Parmenides on this question because of this question of the soul. Saying that if you say everything's changing, then there's not any individual one substances in the soul. Well, what is the one? Can you say that again? What is the one? What is the soul? <coughs> the, uh, if this, does the soul change? If, if everything's changing, then the idea that there's like uh, one and everything, there's souls that are ones, unities, lives and will be certain substances and so therefore this idea that there's you know, constant change there's got to be something outside of this constant change in motion that's not, that's not changing 
something that persists. And what would that be? Something outside the what? So something outside the change. Something that doesn't change. Since you brought up Leibniz, oh man. Okay, I, I don't want to go past eleven. I, you probably don't either, right? Because that would that would be a bad infinity, wouldn't it? Well, it's Leibniz. Okay. He says that the universe is made up of ones, doesn't he? You brought up the soul, right? He says the universe has to be made up of either things that have parts or things that don't. And if it's made up of things that have parts, the parts uh, have to be made up of parts, right? Didn't he say that? Does this part thing just keep on forever? There's all parts and there's no one. But what about the soul? Is the soul parts? Does the soul have parts? You tell me, you have one. It seems to have different faculties. Right? It has qualities, right? It changes, right? But Michael asked, there has to be something that, that doesn't change, right? And what would that be? Why does it have to be something that doesn't change? Well, Michael brought it up. Let's see what Leibniz says. I was just thinking like principles. What is it? Well, <coughs> if, you have, if you have an idea of a one that do you remember which which part he talks about uh, the thing that doesn't change in the soul? Yeah, there's some different sections that correspond to that and all. Well, he says it in the Parmenid, I mean, the monadology, too. Well, wouldn't the idea of the one actually be interesting? That idea itself be an unchanging idea? Why is it unchanging? Because if it, if it changed, like the one exists to, um, if the one exists for the, the idea of, of one, if it changes, then it necessarily changes to the one does not exist. Then you'd be speaking of nothing. Or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the. the Alright. Does the soul have parts? Let's talk about that. I don't know. What would a part of a soul be? Like, would it be you could cut a soul in half? <laughs> Can you cut a soul and get two souls? <laughs> Because I don't know. It's hard to wear shoes. Can you break off part of a soul? <laughs> a soul. Uh, he, says, he says in Article 19 right. that um, if we are to give the name of soul to everything which has perceptions and desires in the general sense, which I have explained, then all simple substances or created monads might be called souls. It says at the very beginning that the monad of which we shall speak here is nothing but a simple substance which enters into compounds. By simple is meant without parts. Okay. Enters into compounds. It could be it can be a part of something, but it can't have parts itself. Compounds. Something that's composed. Composed parts. Parts. Mm -hmm. All right, if it doesn't have parts, does it change? Why not? 
How does it change? Well, there's another thing you'll have to read. But let's think about this, all right? Because I mean, one of the things that Lynn has always emphasized is that the key to science is not, I mean, the opposite idea of what Lynn represents is that the universe is out there and we're in here. <laughs> and there's some universe there that's doing what it's doing and we're here doing what we're doing. Get what I'm saying? Well, give, give an example. You know, caveman sees a, a, a reddish rock. Metallurgist sees a lump of iron. And he's in, the caveman might say, well, I could use this rock to smash this saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> The metallurgist could say, "I can melt this 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 rock down and create iron and build bridges with it." Now, does that change the nature of the rock? Yes. Is the rock different now? Mm. Rock is just sitting there minding its own business. <laughs> And then there's the question of where did, where did the rock come from? <laughs> what did Rick Lynn say about these mountains of iron? Where did they come from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, organisms came to the mountain and said, hmm, I'm going to die now. <laughs> and they deposit their blood, <laughs> and the iron builds up. Iron Mountains. <laughs> iron Wars. Yeah. Right. I'm sure there's other iron that comes from some other. <coughs> it's part of how life, the, the process of life developing in the, on Earth changes the Earth. Right? But mankind, you know, you go from a oh, rock sitting there or a tool to use to kill a saber toothed tiger. <laughs> <laughs> feed Mr. And Mrs. and you know the little cavemen, right? And then you know the concept of or, or you look at dictionaries. I mean, Phil used to always say that if you looked at a dictionary in the 1920s, it said that uranium was a useless white metal. <laughs> useless. Now what is uranium? Useless. Yeah. Necessary. Yes. All right, so, so there's no such thing as like this stuff is out there and we're here and you know it's doing what it's doing we're doing what we're doing it, it, it changes and that's the fun part about nature right but as Lynn says in this uh, project A that I referenced before he said that the whole basis of Hey, look, I mean, I don't I have time to go through monadology. Maybe I can get to a class on that sometime. But I wanted to get all, all these paradoxes, get this out of the way, get your brain churning and screaming and whatever. Because this is the kind of thing you have to think about to conceptualize anything. Because, all right, well, let's we'll just think about Kuza for a minute. What the hell is De Dr. Ignorantia about? If you've read it. What is the subject? What is he talking about? I mean, yeah, he's talking about learning ignorance, right? Being <laughs> to know what your ignorance, right? <laughs> to perfect your ignorance, right? Of the absolute maximum and the uh, contracted maximum and the absolute contracted maximum. <laughs> what the hell? And Lynn says this is the like foundation of science. <laughs> So what is that? If you haven't read it, then obviously it's not a fair question, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have, what is he doing there? If you read it, do you see any relationship between that and what Plato was doing in Parmenides? Mm -hmm. 
Is it, is it possible for there to be existence without oneness? Is it possible to you to, for you to think of something that exists without thinking of oneness? What's involved in oneness? Is oneness just like, you know, like blue? What is oneness? What's the nature of that which you can think about? Well, take the absolute maximum, for example. That's that which is, nothing is opposed to it. And it's, nothing is greater than it. So what is it? Well, he says you can't even think about it the way you think about, you know, normal, everyday sense objects, right? Well, he says that everybody calls it God, but no matter what you attribute to it, you know, you, you can't comprehend it. But what can you know? It's definitely a one, isn't it? Right? You know what it's not. You know it's a one, don't you? Because there's nothing outside of it, nothing that exists. There's no boundaries, right? Because <coughs> if it, if it if there was something outside of it that bounded it, then it wouldn't be the absolute. absolute maximum. You know that everything partakes of it. If it's everything's partakes of it. Oh yeah, there's all those things, right? But you know it's one, right? But what does that mean? What does that imply about the universe? What is the universe? Well, that's the second part. <coughs> First he talks about the absolute maximum that has to be greater than everything and well, it's got all these fun qualities to it, like it's eternal. What's so funny about eternity? doesn't have a beginning or an end it precedes everything else doesn't therefore anything else huh doesn't have a beginning well how can it why because it was where does it come from what is, how does it, like where does it come from if it's the absolute maximum where does it come from I mean, like, you know, a, a baby horse comes from a mother horse, right? The, the, the present comes from the past, right? The future comes from the present. Well, how is, where is the, where is the absolute maximum that's greater, that nothing was greater than it, where does it come from? What caused it? Nothing can cause it. <laughs> nothing can cause it because it's greater than, greater than anything. Nothing is greater than it. Nothing contains it. If something caused it, then that would be greater than it, wouldn't it? I mean, like nothing existed before its existence, which would cause its beginning. Yeah. If it's an absolute maximum. But then there's the fun part about how it has to coincide with the minimum. Because nothing can be opposed to it. All right, let me just wrap this up here. Because obviously we're going to have to continue this at another time. We'll Unless you're, you back, huh? We'll invite you back. You we'll invite me back? Okay. <laughs> Next year? <laughs> so, well, I see a lot of empty there. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Well, next week you have the webcast, and then you have the music oven. After that. And what's that say after that? Something about kept her in a group of one of the Monge Brigades. Monge Brigades, okay, whatever. Okay, maybe sometime before Christmas, or when everybody's gone and there's just like three people here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you can talk about the oneness.
<laughs> well, I can do that myself. I don't need you to answer that. <laughs> you were going to wrap something up? Yes. <laughs> what I was going to wrap up is that this is what you have to think about to understand science. Is, I mean, Lynn said that the monadology was like the, the beginning of science, or, or like the most, what, what, what's the exact wording? It's like the, uh, I mean, not the beginning, but it's one of the most fundamental representations of what science is about. Because it's not just about what ex- exists. It's not about, it, you know, it completely demolishes this idea that science is about you here and the universe there. It's about you and the universe and the process of knowing the universe. It, they all go together. Well, that's in, in the uh, Dr. Ignorantia as well. It all goes together. You, you can't separate the knower and the known and knowledge. It's a unity. So you can't know. I mean, isn't science about knowledge? Right? I mean, that which separates us from animals, that gives us this power to improve our existence, to increase our potential population density, to. Uh, to exist as immortal beings is this power of creating new ideas. I mean, all of it is just ideas. Okay? But when you say just an idea, what do you mean? Because these ideas change the condition of the universe. Right? But, I mean, but these ideas, but they're efficient. In other words, something that occurs in your mind changes the universe. Changes the lawfulness of the universe. You can think, talk about that one too. I mean, are we changing the laws of the universe when we apply a discovery? All right. Well, this is where it resides. And this is the kind of question you have to deal with. Like in the Dr. Ignorantia. Think about think about the idea of the absolute maximum. Just This is your homework. Think about that. Is the absolute maximum like necessary? <laughs> Where did it come from? What does it do? What is your relationship to the absolute maximum? Right? And then think about the idea that he says that we are made in the image of the Creator. I mean, he rigorously goes through the idea that everything that exists in the universe is an image of the Creator. Right? Relatively imperfect. But we've got a special status, right? I guess that's why there's the third part. Mm -hmm. Because we're not just an image of the creator, we have the capacity of creativity. We can generate ideas like the this oneness that we're trying to grasp that, you know, is it that that's the uh, heart of existence and the, the heart of of uh, life and the process of development of the universe. So, and, and that's that's the subject of science. That's the subject of knowledge. We're not. It's not just a, like I said. It's not universe out here and we're over here. We're in it, but we're not just in it. We're changing it. <clears throat> and if you look at you know, Plato and Kuza and Kepler and Leibniz and Riemann and Vernadsky, you know, up through LaRouche, the whole point of it is that the universe is changing. Right? Are you changing with it? Are you making it change? Are you guiding the change? And the, the and the the point is that the thing that makes human existence possible as opposed to baboon existence is the change in the ideas. How do you go from a higher level of idea to uh, a higher level to an even higher level? 
the substance of our existence is this kind of change, this creativity. Or put it negatively. If we don't change the way we think as a culture, as a species, very soon, and change the way we behave, we're not going to exist. So that's a, a fun challenge for you immortal beings to ponder and act upon. And, you know, if you find this torturous and painful, do it to somebody else. Because <laughs> they need it too. <laughs> They're mortal too, so, you know. Spread the joy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop talking. But if you have questions, go ahead. You know. <laughs> What'd you say? So I did really have a good question before. Right. It went down the I river. Uh, the part that is silent comedy says that the only thing that is constant is changing. No, not in the not in the dialogue. He didn't say that. <laughs> the fun thing is, he wrote this poem. His whole thing is that things don't change. That reality doesn't change. But what? But the, the the joke or the punchline in the middle of this dialogue, right? He's talking about the one and the many and the motion and rest and sameness and otherness and all that. He said, "All well, this can't all happen at the same time. All these things are contradictory. So how is it, how's it going to happen at the same time?" Well, Bruce used the example of the spinning top for something that. Uh, changing, but there's part of it. Some in motion mm -hmm. and not in motion. It's down the center. Mm -hmm. But even the center is like rotating. But right. I, I guess I don't, I don't, really, I don't really Well, understand. is a spinning top more of a one than a top that's sitting there? Think about it. Isn't there some kind of a oneness to a spinning top that's not there when it's not spinning? I'll <coughs> 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 we'll put it this way. If you, if you try to change its motion, what happens? Hmm? Well, I guess it depends. It resists you trying to change it. I mean, a, a normal top is sitting there, right? It has inertia in the sense that it resists you trying to move it, right? But if it's spinning, it's really going to resist. I mean, if this didn't happen, then riding a bicycle would be pretty much a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> motorcycle would be pretty dangerous. <laughs> Is it something? Is it something completely different between a, a, a bicycle that's moving, that's rolling, <laughs> pedaling, and the one that's just standing there? Anybody ever think they were cool riding on their motorcycle, <laughs> and then they stop, and then they forget that they stopped? You ever see somebody fall down? And they forget how the motorcycle works. <laughs> <laughs> I think that has something to do with this business of oneness and manyness, because there's a, there's a quality of the, the to the top that it changes. It's more organized, right, around the axis. Does Kuzma say that this, this, the top is spinning in infinite speed? Well, he gives you that idea. He says, well, "What about it?" It's spinning at an infinite speed. Is it spinning at all? <laughs> yeah. It's imaginative. Yeah. It's a You're taking the spinning to infinity. Uh, wouldn't it be? Or how about this? <coughs> you know what the difference is between a, a piece of iron and a magnet? It's magnet has two. We had a magnet thing going here two weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on in a magnet? It's different from just a piece of iron or 
some other metal. One is positive and one is negative. Well, what's going well, on in the magnet? The other. Yeah, but well, why? Those two. Organized. What's going on in the magnet? Inside the magnet. It's different from when it's not a magnet. You, you know about magnetism, right? Mm -hmm. Some oh, things yeah. are magnetized and they're not, right? Yeah. Well, we think it's because the, uh, well, there's atoms in the, in the metal, right? Or molecules, right? And they're spinning, right? Yeah. Okay, well, they have currents, they have electrons. But what happens, what happens when you, like if you put a magnet in a strong magnetic field, magnetic field aligns the, the poles of the, of the spinning atoms, right? So they're all lined up the same way, right? And I mean, all the individual spinning atoms, they create a little magnetic field. But when they're all lined up the same way by a, a magnetic field from the outside, then their magnetic fields become lined up, and then you have what we call a magnet. magnet? Yeah. So in other things, they're not aligned, but in the magnet, they are? Yeah. So that's generally, you have to have something that where the atoms aren't jiggling around too much. Like, they have to be in a crystal formation, like in a metal. Hmm. That's why you can't make a magnet out of, like, marshmallow. Mm. Marshmallow. <laughs> Otherwise, your brain would be a magnet of an MRI, right? This isn't an MRI. Like well, I guess it is, kind of, for a little while. But then it has to, you, know, you don't stay there all day. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, hey Merv, were you talking about how if you hit the magnet, it starts to not be a magnet? You because because they're all the parts are jiggling around and they're not lined up, right? So think about that in terms of one and many. 